Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Corridor Cast. Today's guest is Lou Ferrigno Jr. You may recognize him from the series that we did, Battlefield Rush, or he's on TV in SWAT, playing one of the SWAT guys, which is pretty cool. He's also on 911 and a couple other TV shows as well. Lou Ferrigno Jr. has a unique name. You may recognize the name because his father was the Incredible Hulk. So Lou has a lot of really interesting stories to tell us, such as getting out there, trying to make it in L.A., coming from a background of having a celebrity father. Uh, how do you claim a name for yourself when there's so much pop culture around it already? A lot of really interesting stuff. And I do want to mention this cozy sweatshirt I'm wearing. Well, this podcast is brought to you by this cozy sweatshirt because this cozy sweatshirt is new in the Corridor store. That's right, Corridor. CorridorDigital.com slash store. <laughs> Anyways. What's that? CorridorDigital.store. CorridorDigital.store. <laughs> oh boy. It's crazy. I don't know the URL to my own store, apparently. I'm getting all flustered doing this podcast intro. All right. CorridorDigital.store. <laughs> That's where you go. All right. Enough of that. Push. Let's listen to what the cool stories Lou has to tell us. Hey, Lou, thanks for joining us today on the Corridor Cast podcast. You're happy to be here. Yeah, I appreciate you coming I love out. the blazer, man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Looking very sharp. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, had, I had an audition before this, and I was like, you know what? I buy all these nice clothes for auditions and, and stuff, or even just to be this guy, and I never wear them. So I'm like, screw it. I'm going to start putting things together and be that guy. There you go. You know? It's so. nice to know that you hold our podcast to such a high esteem that you'll dress up for it, even though a lot of people just listen to it. <laughs> I, no, I, I watch it. I watch your podcast. Oh. Is that crazy? That's that's not crazy at all. Okay, someone not in these days. People think watching podcasts they're like you watch, but I'm like, yeah, they're actually great. You know, yeah. I like the nuances and the subtle, like idiosyncrasies of people. Yeah, yeah. that's mm-hmm. awesome. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Lou here, he was in the the Battlefield series that we shot three mo- three years ago called Rush. But since then, you've gone on to do quite a bunch of really interesting things. You're currently – why don't you run down uh, your project list with me real quick here and tell okay. me how, how crazy things have actually gotten. <laughs> things have been great. Um, I, for the last year and a half, I've been shooting a show called SWAT on CBS. Um, it's a SWAT show. It's a, it's a one-hour drama, which um, is going fantastic. We're in our second season. Hopefully, we'll get picked up for a third. Um, I just got done with shooting a second episode of 911, which I'm playing a firefighter in that one. Um, he said, "Don't tap the table." <laughs> um, and then I'm doing Star Girl on it's a DCWB show where I play a superhero. Uh, beginning in March. That sounds really cool. Yeah, that's you sound really busy. <laughs> uh, it's been really good, but I mean SWAT. I'll tell you, doing SWAT. It's a. It was so nice going into SWAT with such great uh, prior knowledge from all the work we did in the tactical stuff with Rush, and oh, a lot cool. of that was to your credit because it was really. Good to know, and you taught it, and well, and slow, smooth, smooth as all that. <laughs> that I was, I was spitting it out as they were teaching us, and I was one of the only guys who knew what was going on. You know, oh, clearing awesome. a room. That warms my awesome. heart. <laughs> yeah, that, that really. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, and even the the other one we did, yeah. I was like, that was it was it was such a nice setup for what's happening now. So thank you, Jake. Great, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Happy to help. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, appreciate it. Now there was one thing you said to me in Detroit when we were filming Rush that really stuck with me, and I think it was like. We were only a couple of days into filming, um, so I'd only known you for a couple of days at that point. And we were talking about, about your name, you know, Lou Ferrigno Jr., and you had mentioned something to me that really stuck with me, and I, I still think about it uh, every once in a while these days. And you're talking about how you, want, you had this drive to go out there and make the name your own. Um, you know, your father's obviously a pretty big figure in, in film. He's played a lot of rather pivotal characters, you know, Hercules, the Hulk, etc., but you had to strive to go out there and define yourself as Lou Ferrigno. As Lou Ferrigno. So when, when somebody says Lou Ferrigno, they're speaking about you. And that really stuck out with me because that's a really, I think, admirable quality, a really cool drive to have to make your name yours. Uh, and that was really, really neat. But I'm curious, like, what are, what are some of the advantages to having the name Lou Ferrigno versus what are some of the disadvantages? <clears throat> well, um, I, I, the advantage for me personally, honestly, is when someone comes up to me and they see the name and like a light shines in their eyes and they're like glowing. And it's like <laughs> the market or when I'm on the phone with someone like in another state, uh, you know, like a Wells Fargo type of thing. <laughs> um, and it just gives them such joy. 
that's what's really great. And that's I'm cool. like, that if, that, and that's what really drove me to do what I do today is because I'm like, my father has had such an impact by playing that character the way he did in these people in people's lives, and mm-hmm. they and they don't know how or why, but I think when people really feel something, they tell you. Um, that's real, and you don't say things to make you feel good, you know. Mm-hmm. And my whole life, people would either recognize my name and tell their story of how they were scared to death on Friday nights, and it just impacted them in such a positive way. That's a big positive for me. Um, and then on the other side, the one of the, a lot of the negatives are people making their their presumptions about you as a person, um, about your talent, about your work ethic. Um, you know, lumping you into another category of celebrity kids. You know, mm-hmm. I never felt that way. Um, but there's, but that's all other people. And I got to a point in my life where I'm like, I can't affect what people think. I just need to show them what I can do, and and let my work speak for itself. Do you think? Do you think having the name Lou Ferrigno gets you into the you know casting offices and okay? So, for? I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, I think it's definitely interesting to see if. If Lou Ferrigno's a son, you know, let's mm-hmm. see what he looks like. Let's see what he sounds like. Let's see, because at the time when I was first starting audition, nobody knew who I was. Um, and I think that it can have, you know, if I get in trouble legally, knock on wood, <laughs> people are going to know it just based on the name. You know, mm-hmm. that big of a kind of a splash will be made just because of my name and my affiliation with my father. So um, that's definitely um, a negative to it. But, I, you know, that's why I stay... Um, on nice, like straight and narrow path for the most part. You know, like I try to do good. I try to, I'm grateful for what I have and what my father and my mother especially has uh, given to me and provided me with my entire life and so the support. Um, so it'll always be a, an answer or a question that I'll have to address. But I address it with gratitude and I address it with um, being, I'm just very thankful for what I have now because I've really worked hard at something that's, a craft and I found that and I can lose myself in that and instead of blame people for this or expect this or ent- entitlement's a big deal you mm-hmm. know with with a lot of people unfortunately um, and there's nothing more more unappealing I think than someone who's just really entitled and believes that they deserve something that they haven't worked for mm-hmm. you know so yeah I think it's a really healthy mindset like what are you doing to go out there and conquer the world so to speak what are you doing to make it Make it yours. I do my dishes every day. I do everything <laughs> like I do anything, Nico. I, every little thing, I just work on moving forward and, and doing I, – I, I paint, and I paint every edge. I paint – it's like Steve Jobs with the back end of the cabinet in his book. You know, mm-hmm. everything has to be addressed. So I stay balanced in as much as I can in all facets of life, physically, um, spiritually, mentally, um, through work I mean I it's every day and it's a crazy business you never know but I stay truthful to myself and I I do my best to really live a positive healthy lifestyle does that discipline get exhausting at all very much so all the time um I I got to a point in my life where I was like because I'll a guy like me they're gonna make me take my shirt off at any turn right I'm like Mm -hmm. all right so someone I know that I can be shredded if I wanted to be shredded, right? Mm-hmm. But it would take a lot. It would take a lot of eating what I don't want to eat, eating a lot of what I don't want to eat when I don't want to eat it, do working hard, keeping in line. But it, someone's going to pay that guy to be that have that physique and be this on our project. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, I can do the. I need to do the most I can do to be that guy. Hmm. So I really started taking a turn and being more serious with how I was eating. Um, and really taking everything else a little bit more seriously with my self tapes, which Star Girl ended up being a self tape, hmm. and just taking everything, just hitting it harder. Because I'm like, if I go down, I'm gonna go down burning, you know, in flames. Because I'm like, it's a, I'm running on hope as an actor. You know, you don't, you, there's nothing guaranteed. Yeah. So I just try to do everything in my life as well as I can do it, whatever it may be. I think there's a common thread I've seen with a lot of bodybuilders, and Jake, maybe you've observed this too, which is mm-hmm. people who have a good physique, I think people usually associate somebody you know, being shredded with somebody who's like aggressive, and that's really never the case in my experience. In fact, it's discipline that I, I see as like the most common trait with anybody who's in really good physical shape. It comes from like this calm discipline, and I see it in you as well. Now, you've been 
you've been pretty involved in the bodybuilding side of, I guess, or the bodybuilding world. Um, you know, kind of, I, there's like a, an event that you were hosting. I don't know if you still host it mm-hmm. now. Um, would you like, is that a common trait that you see amongst like other bodybuilders? Like this so it's like sense of discipline or like, I guess the question is rather, what does it take to drive yourself to that point to be on these schedules and be on this regimen? Like, how do you, where do you find that energy from? Um, well, it, it really comes down to if you scrape all the like excess dead skin away, it comes down to really knowing who you are and knowing what you need mm. to get to where you need to go. And then that's really what it comes down to. If you, I know that I need did to eat before this podcast or else I get really bitchy. I just and I don't mean to, but I don't start thinking right and I'm not as positive and I'm not as I just, you know, I need to be I have to have any kind of food in my system. Did mm. it, did it take you years to to learn that or did it um it just got I got to the point where I can't you can't rely on people. I can't rely on people to be, to have things ready for me and usually as I started working because as you work on set like as an actor, just be prepared to be hungry and be prepared to be uh, bored because I'm mm. sitting there on and you know on set and I'm not I don't have anything with me. I'm in a bad mood and then finally I'm like, as long as I have food and I have something to do and something to put my time into, I'm like I could be here all day. I love set. I love I love every moment on set. I love the random conversations, the interactions, the stuff that we talk about all the time. And you never know who you're gonna meet. As long as I'm fed. I'm, I can go all day. I'm good. <laughs> but it comes down to really knowing who you are. And then the discipline, I mean, it's consistency with anything. It's what you choose and where you want to be and the consistency and the steps it takes to get there with anything in life. You know, you have to be consistent. So, what, What's it like on uh, the day of a big big show like SWAT? What's the day in, day in, day-to-day like? <clears throat> um, it's great. I mean, it's awesome, man. It's uh we got 23 episodes and every other, I mean, everybody else is a regular. I'm a guest star. So on that episode, it's, it could be on location at some awesome locations. Like one time our base camp is right here in Chinatown. Um, and we got shuttled over to some Firestone factory, I guess hmm. something different. Uh, but these massive, massive locations, I had no idea what it was like. There's an armor, they got everything set up. And like, I just, I think about like <laughs> geeking out, man. It's like, they like, they oh, flashbang, bam. And the pucks, like put the puck on, explosions. And then you have a, expl- like a pyro guy come in and he has his thing and, and the budget's great and the show's awesome. And it's like, it's, it's, it's really exciting for me. Now I'm like, you know, as a kid, I was loving all this stuff. So yeah. I'm like a grown up kid now. Huh. So other people, it's not really in their, like in their wheelhouse, you know, but for me, it works. As long as you got a book and some food. Yeah, dude. I mean, I'm just, I stay, rice cakes help a lot, you know, just keeping something in there. And it's really the act of just keeping myself satiated. So it's not like, because then I lose myself. Right. Yeah. What, what goes into getting a, a scene finished for like, for SWAT? Like, how does it start? And then how does it end? Like, what happens in between those? A lot of people, you know, they see the finished product on TV. It's, you know, some guy talks, cuts, some other guy talks and sure. the scene wraps up and that's the end. Mm. But like, how does that happen? So there's A, B, C camera, three camera. I mean, there's A and B, and then there's Steadicam, mm-hmm. right? And that's always going. I mean, you got a, three camera operators. You got three assistants. You got, I mean, all people moving all the time. A lot of moving masters. A lot of, lot of shots that are just like uh, rack to this person or, or pan up to this, like a lot of these splicing shots. A lot of times, joke, we joke about it because it's like, we'll spend, one day we spent MacArthur Park for like 12 hours and it was like a minute and a half of the show. <laughs> you know, like we were walking around, running around. And so you never know what's going to make it. But um, every director's, for the most part, each director has a couple episodes they've done, but it's always a different rotation. Hmm. So between having a different writer and a different director, it's, it's challenging to really... Um, it's, you know, it's fun. I love it. I, 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 you know, I, if as an actor, it's like, there's a lot that I can't imagine producing it because there's just a lot of heads. There's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of decisions to be made. And then with everything set up perfectly and then someone's an hour and a half late to set or it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's like, Oh God. Yeah. But I'm sitting there with my rice cakes, happy, (laughs) just hanging out. I'm, I'm on time. I'm good. But things happen. So, but I mean, you'll have the master. We'll start with the master, four or five takes of that. And then basically we punch into coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of scenes, surprisingly, some scenes take longer than others. But I mean, a lot of the scenes that we do are at the eagle's nest around a big um, kind of a desk like this. And we're talking. Um, but it's every scene is about, f- I'd say four hours it would take. 
Do you get many shots that it take, or is it kind of a one and done thing? I'd say no. I'd say no more than six, seven, and no less than three. Okay. Now I'm I'm curious too because, you know, TV shows TV shows rotate directors, but they obviously are keeping the same actors for the mm-hmm. characters for every episode. So what what does a new director bring to the table when they come in? Like when you're shooting one episode with one director, and then you shoot another episode with another director, like you're playing obviously a consistent character, so they can't really step in and like change who your character is. So how does that relationship work? Like what, what can a director bring to the table when they're a new director on an already established show? I think some, some directors like to push different shots. Like we had one, one of the Christmas episodes, the director, I did not work with him, but it was like a four minute, it was a one shot. Just oh, really? all thing, just like from person to from it was like, and then it just it was a beautiful shot, and then it ended up in a crane. So then he had to hook it back on the crane, and just that shot was a risk, and he took that shot, he took that risk, and it played beautifully. Although I don't think many people will look at that and be like, oh my goodness, that was a one shot, you know? It mm-hmm. was like a yeah. long ass wonder. Um, I think attitude is huge in terms of getting things done on set, um, and I think relatability is great. I mean, people want to be friends and work with your friends and be cool. Um, but I'm not really in the tone meetings. And I ask the same questions. I think, how do you maintain that consistency of tone, of of energy with different directors? You know, because some people aren't necessarily action directors that they'll do more, to kind of do a couple TV shows rather than doing big budget. You know, you're going to have a big budget action director and typically do a big budget action film again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I think attitude, I think um, suggestions, I think m- differentiate people from from one another, but also... Um, I just think sometimes, and also each director kinds of brings like one will bring like a cart on the set, like a coffee cart or one, will bring like <laughs> a, which keeps people motivated, keeps the crew pumped and it keeps uh, a good, nice kind of rapport between all heads involved. You know, there's, I mean, it's gotta be like 400 people working on the set in terms of like the rigging guys, the transpo guys, the, you know, on one day. Right. And I'm like, and half of them you don't even see. Right. So be able to have, be level headed and it's, you know, it's TV's tough. I mean, some of, some, I don't want to say. There's there's egos on and on every end and there's deadlines. Mm-hmm. And so you got to be able to deal with it and be on time and be consistent. And if you can't do it, I mean, eventually those opportunities wane. Now, yeah. out of out of all my friends that I know, you probably have the squarest jaw. Me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> really? By far. You by far have the the most defined jaw. <laughs> yeah. No yeah, way. Can't tell the difference. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> do you find yourself being typecast you. as like the kind of jaw military guy. the jaw guy? <laughs> the, like the military esque like clean cut <clears throat> I guess yeah, military yeah. guy, cop yeah. guy, you military know. hero. When you Okay, so when you say jaw, you mean like this part or like this part? A little bit here, okay, but also this corner right here, like this right well, here. Also this is your, che- your cheekbones too. The cheekbones. You got those high really? cheekbones. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. funny. And there's a line yeah. that goes here too, like a very yeah. clearly okay. defined line. Um, kids made fun of me in, really? in school. They said I had a head like a pentagon because <laughs> we were learning shape, and they're like, "Oh, that looks like Lou's head." And I'm like, and I didn't know, and I didn't. I was like, I just thought I had this blocky head, and like I, I never. I was bummed about it for a long time. I was like, you know, and then finally when I grew up and I'm like my face kind of got out, like. Girls seem to like, like you. They would say structured face or mm. strong jaw. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that really means. Um, and I kind of see it now, but, um, but thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, typecast. Enough yeah. about me. A typecast <laughs> thing. What I mean, do, do you feel like you're? Do you feel like you've been kind of typecast as like the the military esque character? Look, Nico, I don't give a shit, man. I'm here to play, and I'm gonna do my job the best. You can typecast me however you want, but I'm, I work my ass off to be as rounded off as possible. In every which way, I challenge myself as an actor. I push myself physically. I push myself in terms of taking risks. Um, I work my tail off to just do the small things important. So if I'm going to give someone a great performance, even if I'm not right for it, mm-hmm. uh, but people are eventually going to come around and say, of course, we see him like this. I'm going to let people see that for themselves, though. I'm not going to tell them and say and and kind of be resentful and say, oh, I don't want to do it because of this. If you're good at something or you fit some role, do it to the best of your ability. Make the best of it. You know, it's like, yeah. it's funny. It's like, like, let's say, I, like, there's, there's like the beautiful girl who comes up here from Des Moines, Iowa, right? And she's beautiful, very prettiest girl in her school. And then she becomes an actress. And then she keeps playing the hot girl or the, or the stripper or this. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing saying like, well, I am more than the stripper. I don't want to do that. I'm beyond that. It's out of my, it's out of my, it's, um, I can do other things. I'm better than just that. 
and then you don't get a job doing anything else. But you're so you're self sabotaging. So why not if you're offered a job or if you're presented an opportunity to perform in this in a similar category, do that because it's all about for me the performance with and the moments within that. It's yeah. for me it's beyond money. It's beyond fame. It's any of that. Like I've seen all that. Uh, what I need is those true moments that affect people on screen. And it doesn't matter if you're a military, it doesn't matter if you're a stripper, it doesn't matter if you're a superhero. We're all human and we have those moments and for me as an artist, as an actor, that's what I give a shit about. Like casting if I do you want to if I'll say then I'll at some point I'll basically be like, "All right, I'll do I'll do your military movie, the 15th one I've done mm -hmm. if you pay me this much amount of money." Yeah. And if you want to pay it, that's fine because I can kill it because <laughs> there's never going to be a shortage of tough guy needing for needing a tough guy or a military guy i might not be right for it but hey i'm gonna make if the shot the, the script is good whatever i'm happy to work i'm happy to be an actor yeah i love that attitude thank you man yeah i feel i mean it's to be in a position it's always worth like stepping back and like looking at how lucky one is to be even close to doing what you want to be doing i mean you're even more lucky to be doing what you actually want to be doing but to even like kind of get close to it it's already further than 99 percent of the people get to um, and at least to me, it's always refreshing to see somebody who's like, yeah, I, I see that and I cherish it and I run with it with the energy I got. And I, I see that yeah. in you. And that's really cool. Thank you, man. I mean, it's you, you, an act you can have, cause it's just words, letters into words on a page, um, whatever the role is, mm -hmm. but you can take those same words and have it done 50,000 ways by 50,000 different guys. You can make this one role incredible and incredibly memorable by just taking your own way and giving a shit enough to make it different and making it your own. Now you lose those those feelings and those drives when you start to feel you deserve more and you're better than just this and I can do more. That's all bullshit. That's all self-grandizing, um, entitled kind of mentality thinking you're beyond anything because because you can make, you can lose yourself in a role regardless of what it is. I mm -hmm. mean, if you say ex-military, that's not one or two guys. Like people from all yeah. over the world, cultures, everything have been ex-military. So it's like you know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's so. true. How do you? What do you do personally that I guess differentiates you from the rest of the military faces or whatever that casting might be? Like I just do the same thing every time. Just the same. <laughs> thing. <laughs> just, no, no. Um, do you have Do you have like a secret that that you employ more than you found other people or that you've learned? Let's get what do you mean? Like a look or something? <laughs> no, or like uh, like a way to internalize a character or a way to um, I don't know, you know, like a facial tick or like uh, something that that you found where where you can say, okay, you know, this guy does it this way, this guy does it that way. But mm -hmm. one thing that I've found is is this secret works for me and it works really well. Well, I mean, I've I've done a lot of improv, which is working on low status. You know what I mean? And it's because high status is easy. You can be just the jerk and whatever all you want. Wait, um, low status? Sorry, can you clarify? What you high mean? status and low status. So like, so um, an audience loves to see a transformation from low to high status. So if we're on stage and basically we, it's improv, so we choose our roles naturally. And and you say, hey, and then you, you take the, sh the, the shopkeeper, the aggressive shopkeeper, mm -hmm. and then I'm the aggressive florist. And then it's two aggressive guys going after each other. That's not interesting to see. Mm -hmm. They want to see um, a low status, a high status, and then I'm like the guy, okay, I'll keep sweeping the floor. I'm sorry. I'll just keep going. And then also the trans the transformation from low status to high status. And then the sweeper go, oh, my God, what is this? A lotto ticket? Screw you. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm done. Uh -huh. Then they're like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. You know, people like to see that transformation. So – Working on low status stuff and just working enough to know what angles work for me, what what things I like for my performance. It's very hard for me to watch my performance, which is kind of crazy because <laughs> I, this is what I do and I'll do it on set and I love it. And then I see it and I'm like, I don't want to see it. It's, just, <laughs> it's a little wacko, but but I look at it from a very diagnostic standpoint and a very in terms of how what I can do differently. Um, that's, that's interesting. I've never heard the, those terms used, the low status, high status thing. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's real. I mean, that's the key to like a role right there is you have someone low status and then the transformation to high status is really where the where the art form totally. is. Yes. And a lot of guys in my category that I think that look, well, first of all, a lot of guys in my category are British, Australian, um, guys that are international from different countries. For I don't know, there's just an American kind of lack of this type, I guess. Because um, hmm. I see a lot of the guys working in roles that I would love to do there. From but that's aside the point. But um, I think just just working and knowing 
what I can do. I have the tools in the toolbox to do certain things. Allows me the freedom to really lose myself within the role. You know, yeah. so whereas if I'm because if I'd be upset if I could play one way, one thing, one way and then keep getting hired. Well, yeah, it'd be frustrating because I don't want to do that again. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that one thing one way again. But no, I've worked to really dig to be able to do that one thing 50, 60 different ways and be like, oh, I could do it like this. So I don't ever see it really. I'll do military movies, whatever. It's all military expat stuff. I You find those things in it based on the script, based on the character, what you can really play with. You use your past. You use what you can use. But I think that I have a, a very natural... Um, I'm, people are, grav- are understanding of me being former athlete, former military. Yeah. I'm a bigger dude. You know, I'm not a huge dude, but I'm like still like I hold myself with a way that is very easy to go high status. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting in the, transform- the formative aspect I was saying. It's interesting for someone who looks like me, who seems like they have it all together, to be very low status. Hmm. That's interesting because we're like, that's that's not what we expect, you know. So mm-hmm. the softening, the kneading of of the hardness, the exterior, the shell that comes out with that that comes from being beaten down in this business, hmm. you know, for years, and just keeping um, a good perspective about it. Yeah, that's really really cool. It's huh. an interesting perspective on that. Like, so when it comes to like your style of acting, I mean, you know, acting is one of those things that's like really hard to define. I feel like for a lot of people, like, is it make believe? Like, are you just like when I look sad, do I, am I just like moving my face muscles to where they would be if I was actually <laughs> sad? Like, or, or am I trying to like get really deep and like bring up real emotion? And like, I, mean, I feel like acting, it can fluctuate from all the way on the real side to all the way on the completely fabricated. I'm just, you know, making a fake smile yeah. kind of side of things. Um, where does it lie for you? Like, what is, what is your approach to trying to portray a scene in an interesting but authentic way? Like, how do you achieve that? You, it, it's funny because, yeah. <laughs> Acting is exactly what you don't want to do. You don't want to act. <laughs> right. You want to get yourself and load yourself up with memories, with thoughts, with everything that's 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 parallel with this character and this how close as you can get it. Um, and just living and being in that moment. Just living. Just being. Hmm. Just doing nothing. Not acting. Not indicating. Nothing. Just sitting there. And I mean having thoughts. And having thoughts. Uh, shout out to Leslie Kahn, my awesome acting teacher. It's all about the thought. It's not about the thought of what I'm going to say. It's not about the thought of what you just said and how I feel about that and living through that moment. The audience will put themselves into the role, into the story. Hmm. Uh, the minute you start acting, people go, oh, well, that was, he's acting. Like, he's not being that. You know, he's, yeah. be, he's pretending to be that. Or if I'm like, if I'm sad, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> don't try to cry if you're not going to cry. <laughs> like, just be sad. Huh. And if you can't get there, don't be an actor. But if you, I can be sad on a job. I have a lot to be sad about. So I can do that and have thoughts. But it's not, it's funny because it's so counterintuitive to say I'm an actor. Like you go to acting class to learn how to act. But then when you get to be act an actor, you're not acting. Yeah. You're not pretending. You're just wearing your audition clothes <laughs> uh, every day. <laughs> you know? So now I'm like, this is me. So how do you, how do you reset? When you get into a role and you're not acting and you're required to be sad or you're required to be eccentric, it's what do you go back to to find yourself? Um, the gym has been my anchor for the most part in terms of really knowing, being one-on-one with my mind, mind and my body, which is one thing. Um, but I think, you know, I just did a film um, called Dreamcatcher. It's going to be really cool. It's a thriller. And there's a scene when I had a nice four minute, like I come in the theater and I'm looking for the guy and I see this and what is this and a bloody thing here. And I'm like, oh my God. And then eventually I had to find the killer and then it was a death scene. Um, and I wanted it to be really good because the guy was much smaller than me and he was trying to like suffocate me with his tarp. Hmm. And I was like, I wouldn't believe that. If a guy comes up to me, so I'm going to knock his ass out and <laughs> run away. I'm done, right? So we, we added a little hit of the crowbar to the head and all that stuff. And he wasn't really like going for it. And I was like, you know what? This one, go for it. Like really go for it. And uh, he did. And it was scary because I took and I knew it was going to sell the scene was the, <gasps> the inhale and the bag goes into the mouth and whatever. And I took good three good deep breaths and it was completely I was suffocating. Like hmm. I couldn't. And then eventually when I hit the ground, I had to pull even though I was dead. I was out of frame, but I had to pull it away from my mouth. Because I was like, that's how people die and get suffocated. And you fucking die. And that's it. I'm sorry for cussing. That's okay. Um, and so, and I was driving along. And then all of a sudden, this thought came into my mind. I was like, do I need to go see someone about this? Because <laughs> I was like, this did this leave an imprint in my mind? Because I'm like, that's scary shit. And then the scene, yeah. I was dead. But I was like, that was kind of gnarly. So that was intense. Um, 
resetting is just really kind of getting back to the work and kind of just you know do what you can to kind of just release things physically and just get out of it but know that your next job is not guaranteed and you really want to be prepared when you go in for a role and not just jump ahead because things will come up that you're not prepared for and it'll be a disaster hmm. so a lot of breathing exercises yeah you know a lot of reading um i paint painting helps me really kind of get back down to like when i just exhale i have a nice much finer sharp stroke and it's it's good you have a style of painting yeah it's like i'd say it's pop surrealist it's very hard lines colorful very beautiful ferrigno underscore art on instagram is all of it um and if you if you haven't seen it you actually be like wow it's actually pretty good i'm gonna check it you out. know but i don't you never really finish with a piece of work of art but mm -hmm. these are pretty cool and i have to say i'm like i'm very proud of the work that i've done um but that helps me really kind of get back down to ground zero yeah, I will, I will say, like, when you showed me your paintings when I first met you, it was quite a surprise to see that other side of you. Because they're, they're nice paintings. Thank you, man. Yeah. They're better now. That's good. Yeah. That's <laughs> why you asked about the walls when you came in. <laughs> yeah. Because you're thinking, hey, what would make a good, like, you, know, you, th you look at a wall and you see, sure. yeah. you oh, see yeah. a piece of art on it. All the time. Yeah. But I don't think you guys can afford me, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I'm very. I mean, I'm very perceptive, you know. And I, I just like the little things. Like, I love how you guys have have displayed the the logo in so many different ways across the office, and, and artistically, it's like it's great, you know. And even the panel right there, the sound panel, turned diagonally beautifully. <laughs> you know, I appreciate these things. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. So, when you are uh, when you're playing a character, <clears throat> and you know you're putting yourself in this other, I guess, person's shoes for potentially weeks, if not months, at a time, do you ever find yourself kind of losing your sense of who yourself is in that process like when you're when you're able to make yourself somebody else on a frequent basis where that's your profession do you ever find that like who you are is just another role that you're just used to playing um you know there's always a piece of you that comes with to every character to make it real you know because if i want to be like Woo, from from venus it's like <laughs> like this guy's this, that doesn't work it's not real yeah. like you know what i mean um and what and the way i booked swat is there was like a scene the first scene was it just said we there's a joke and then a wingman laugh in parentheses and then spider-man and that was it <laughs> so that wingman laugh was a million different ways to do it and you could have been done all these forced different things but i just did it how naturally i would do it that i've i've caught on to people laughing about when i just have a genuine response did it like that book the job you know so there has to be a piece of realism to that now, I'll be honest, th uh, the work that I've done professionally hasn't really, I mean, Rush did. It really gave me a chance to really get into that character because it was a it was a nice long piece. There was a lot to it. Um, and the relationships, I think, in terms of how you deal with the relationship with someone else, a lot of the character can come out in, through that. But I haven't really got a lot of uh, dialogue heavy roles or characters yet. Mm -hmm. So Rex Tyler should be one of the biggest ones. And there's a lot to that. Um, but I try not to, I have to preserve my sanity as an actor because every day is insane. What we're doing is insane. It's, it's doing the same thing over with, what's insanity? Doing the same thing over with expecting it's different results. Mm -hmm. So if I don't go to class, I'm not getting better. And if I'm not getting better, I'm doing the same thing. If I go to audition after audition after audition and doing the same thing and not booking and wanting to book, that's textbook insane. So I try to, I try to, I have to keep one foot, um, one foot on planet Earth before I really try to say I'm going to lose myself or I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. Um, I know that what what I buy is real human emotion, real human situations, and and all that stuff. Not I'm going to show you how great I am in my <laughs> moments. Like, come on. Like, you know what I mean? I want to see being affected more than anything else. One, one thing is emoting and showing how good you are as opposed to really letting that ball drop and being doing just about nothing but letting that ball drop. That, to me, is, is more fascinating than how much I can show you or whatever. So, hmm. And a lot of it is just being calm, being available, and being relaxed. So, And that's the hard part is really being calm and relaxed. Because you have 200 people on set looking at you on monitors and everything – high stakes and you have to say these lines when he doesn't say and have and be believable and actually and you have to be ready for that yeah and you i just mean go. if you've never done it you will i mean as a, if you want to be an actor and you want to do that and get thrown into that limelight you will my guess is you'll fail because there's too much yeah. to do 
to make it seem and be and make it seem believable and relaxed Mm -hmm. and be that you can't act relaxed if you're not relaxed you know what i'm saying like (laughs) you just are relaxed so it's a funny it's a it's funny though it's like the big part of the job is just really being relaxed and letting that channel be open to receive um those little nuances you know and you feel like to you to be relaxed it seems like to you that means being prepared Mm -hmm. like the more prepared you are the more relaxed you are and preparing does that mean just like you know obviously obviously you know knowing the lines but beyond that is it delving into like you know creating backstory for this character is it rehearsing like to you what is being prepared as an actor being prepared is for me goes way beyond being prepared as an actor um that's i mean that's my job that's what i'm supposed to do so yes i'm gonna have the words down and everything else i'm prepared on a level of there's so many people on set and people i want to meet and i'll talk to i'll research people's names and I'll see what they've done and opportunities to talk with them or even know who I'm talking with and know the, what this person can do and being prepared on where I can go with an actor or in a scene. And honestly, the more prepared I am, the calmer I, I am. Because as we started the podcast, I got a little sweaty because I don't know what we're talking about. You know, you could ask me some invasive questions, you know. But um, yeah. so that kind of is like, uh, but those nerves make you alive. But as an actor, I know that I'll be physically prepared. And a lot of that comes with being in shape. Because when you're on set and you're working, you're not getting it. You know, there's no shape. Like we have a gym on set, but hours are long. It's tough. It's it's so hard to. You have to stay healthy. It's so there's so much to it. Um, but beyond just being, I know. I mean, I've I've mapped out the Google routes. How much time I need to get there. Where I can eat around there. I have food packed with me a lot of times. Like I'm prepared on mm-hmm. many different levels. And then I can just kind of breathe. Because hmm. I'm like, I don't need to worry about what time craft services or like, because I'll be like, oh, breakfast orders, can I get you one? And then I'll like say a breakfast order and then I have three and a half seconds <laughs> to eat it. And then I'm in a van. And I'm like, yo, oh my God, this is frazzled. I can't like, I have to be prepared for all of that. So I eat before the house. I do all that stuff. So n- there's no surprises. Mitigate the yeah. damage done uh, by the surprises, essentially. Yeah. So do you find yourself uh, as part of your craft, do you find yourself observing, observing others to... You know, like the laugh thing you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I find myself doing this when I'm thinking about writing or I'm, I'm thinking about a character that, that I'm trying to create. Is I'll, I'll, I'll think back to moments when I think of other people doing something or other people saying something. Do you, I, I know that's very important in writing. Do you find it's also important in acting to, to take experience of, of, of observing other people and, and applying that to maybe your own roles? Yes, I think, uh, I, but you have to know that it works. You know, like there's actors that do certain things and get cast in certain roles because what they do for that role works. So like I have a, I have a buddy that is just funny, like just funny how he is. But I, I'm not funny like the way he's funny. Mm-hmm. So if I try to do something I thought was really funny that he did <laughs> in my way, it doesn't work. Because sure. I mean, if I do it in my way, it'll work. But if I try to do it like he does it, it doesn't work. Yeah. You know, so I think stage is important to really kind of work things out and get an immediate feedback on what works comedically and what works dramatically in terms of gripping an audience. Um, that's that's a great place to start. But I think um, but I think it's really just it has to be true to what you're doing and who you are uh, the most part. But you have to I mean, in terms of observation, my mind goes every which way. Yeah. When I when I watch films for probably the majority of my life halfway through the movie 95 percent of the time i have no idea what's going on in the movie because i if i don't know what's going on because i'm so in tune to the moments i'm only watching the moments are they believable if he said that i'm watching all that yeah so i don't i'm not looking at plot ah oh, nice okay so this is exposition this i don't i've never seen it like that i've mm-hmm. only seen how real it is with the moments and then halfway through the movie i'm like what is this movie about because <laughs> i'm like that's real that's not i don't believe that and i think it works as me being an actor but I observe everybody all the time, everything. I try to be out of my phone. I try to think. It's interesting what's what makes someone charismatic and what makes someone interesting and what makes someone funny and what gravitates towards this. And it's all those little nuances that people have um, that are really a byproduct of just an authentic reaction. You know, like just people who are authentically them, I think is so cool. Hmm. You know, I don't think what's because what's cool. Like, go be cool. What's cool? Being yourself. Is yeah. Being Confidence. yourself. Yeah. There's nothing cooler than just being yourself. Because, like, look at this jacket. This is cool. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is, I don't wear stuff like this, but I'm like, I feel pretty cool. You know? But yeah. I'm like, hey, this is what I put together. And I'm like, that's cool. Um, being like everybody else isn't cool. So uh, I like to learn from other people and, uh, and just pay attention. 
just pay attention every day because it's I, I, my job is to replicate the human condition and make it as real and believable as humanly possible because it affects people on that certain level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I'll just I'll be doing a scene in class and I'll be sitting there, take a breath, quiet, and it's like absolute silence, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like that is that's so sexy to me because I'm sitting there and everybody's gripped and I'm like you know, but they know that I believe it and they're probably like oh god I don't want to be in there with them and even if it's <laughs> awkward or not like whether it's good or it's really awkward at least they're like you know yeah it's, so a, rea- it's, it's a reaction yes yeah. and that to me is like within that silence is just like a booming like just this booming echoing like like rumble for me that's mm-hmm. so like you know I'm like ah oh. like from, <laughs> from action to cut. I'm living in the most peaceful time of my life, and it's so awesome because I will die for those moments. I'll die, <laughs> I'll die for my crowd. I'll do whatever I need to do to do this, what I do. And I don't care if you like me or not, or you think I'm good or not, or whatever. It doesn't matter. From action to cut, I'm in control. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we could do it a thousand times, but between action and cut, I'm the one making the calls. And yeah. I'm, you know, I mean, I love working directors, but I think just think that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, that in this world, everybody's set up for those moments. And then some actor can just be some douche and rude, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like so funny. It's so crazy. Yeah, it's a crazy yeah. world. It's a, yeah. It's yeah. Wild. It's, yeah, I suppose like, you are you are telling the cameras where they have to point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to walk over here. You better point the camera at me. <laughs> exactly, dude. Everything has to be, you know, And but people get lost in that. People get lost in the, in the idea of Hollywood and celebrity, and it's not that. And I think... My father was a bodybuilder first, and then he became this, I mean, iconic care figure, you mm-hmm. know? And he's been an actor ever since, but he doesn't have, I have just this, I, my, I exist for this. And I just, and I'm okay with, with saying that and being yeah. that, and I am that, mm-hmm. you know? I'm not, I don't think I'm your quintessential actor and your typical actor, but that's what makes me special, you know? But I just, I, I'm always seeking to go further yeah. and deeper into the truth. How much do you value celebrity, considering that's, you know, something that, you are close to with your family like is it something that has really no meaning to you at this point and it's not it's insignificant or is it something where it's just like a part of the two like the, one of the tools of your trade so to speak um you know it's funny it's it's interesting because if you're if you're good at anything it'll garner attention mm-hmm. you know whether you want to or not you're uh, being good at something will will that but celebrity has been so much more commoditized than and fame is a commodity at this point, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And people being famous for just being famous and reality people. And and I like the reality shows when you're like learning about, let's say, the Degley's Catch and you're learning about these things in life that are great. Mm-hmm. But it's everything changes when these people try to do anything else because like you're not a celebrity. Like you mm-hmm. don't, you're a fisherman or you're like log in the woods. Like, you're not supposed <laughs> right. to, sorry. But they're given celebrity because they're on this TV show. Mm-hmm. So I, but I've seen it from a real, very world famous uh, admiration level of separate celebrity. Like my father was genuinely and is genuinely famous, like mm-hmm. really famous people from all over the planet. I'm talking like I was in Thailand one time, and one of the mail clerks saw my saw my ticket, my and he was like, for like Hulk, Hulk. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I come across half, all the way across the world. And I still like was like, oh my god, Hulk everywhere. Um, <laughs> So for me, it's different there. And within that, I mean, my dad loved bodybuilding and he just loves it more than anything. And that's what, so he was never in it for the fame. It happened, but how he dealt with it, we were always around very famous people, good people and not good people. But it was interesting to see, and my mother too, like had a very grounded perspective about what fame was, who we are and who she wanted her kids to be. Um, So for me, fame, I've, I've honestly, I've been le- living with a very high, a level of fame that I didn't do anything to procure. Mm-hmm. I just was given this fame through this name. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've seen it and I've seen what it does to people and I've seen how people react to it. And so a lot of, it's interesting. And I can go on and on and on about how people can change on a dime and pretend to be your friend or have um, a litany of ulterior motives. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I'm very, I don't want to say jaded, but I'm very conscious of the fact of what is real and what is not. Like last night I had, I had to reach out to my godparents and I was like, I need to just hang out and have dinner with you. You know, I'm a single guy. I don't have much to really spitball with someone, um, anyone. So I was like, I just need to get grounded down to reality. Hmm. I went to a party and it was a, it was a rap thing and it was just so Hollywood. You know, and mm-hmm. like I was having a good time, and everyone was very sweet. But like, you know, there's a peripheral like, oh my god, like, oh, we have, yeah, we should, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you know, like, 
like rock climbing with you was so much fun, you know, because it was mm-hmm. like cause we got along and it was great um, in Detroit and it was like real, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And so so it, when it's people just doing real things. So I and that's a definite advantage is I've been I've been blessed with this glimpse at what fame is mm-hmm. without having to have the constant like, uh, uh, oh, my God, like people would be waiting like three deep in restaurants when I was young to get a signature, an autograph from my dad while we were at, at dinner. And there was times when they were like, can I get your autograph too? And I signed it because like, <laughs> they just wanted my dad's autograph. Yeah. You know, they're just trying to be nice. And he's just like, yo, I'm eating. You know, mm-hmm. he'd be mobbed around the, around the world. We'd go to Amsterdam. There'd be him. He'd walking with two other guys and there'd be about three feet of space. And then just like 50 dudes just mm. like walled together, yeah. walking, like following him through the streets. Like, I, you know, and we get lost, my mom and I. But they don't give a shit because I'm just this kid. So they don't know who I am. And they find out I'm loose kid. Okay. So I'm getting like surrounded by all these dudes that's just mobbing my dad, for waiting for pictures, waiting to be, see him, waiting to look at him. You know, it's it's like part freak show, part celebrity, world, like like movie star. Like uh, it was crazy. It was interesting. So that's another big. Yeah. Piece. Yeah. Gr- growing. So growing up like in that environment, like. There's, I mean, everybody has this thing where, like, they've taken certain things for granted, and you get older, and you experience the rest of the world, and you're like, wait, every kid doesn't get to experience this. This is unique to me. And, you know, to you, that was your world, you know, at a certain point in general. So, like, what was one thing that you, growing up, then once you reached, like, kind of that age of self-awareness, looked around and was like, that's very unique, what I got to experience. Like, is there something that stands out to you that's, like, that experience, whether it's you know, meeting meeting movie stars in real life just all the time versus, you know, being somebody who lives on the other side of the world and they never experience that? Or is it, like, what, are there some, like, unique experiences that you can point to where it's like, this is something that I look back on and really stands out as being a special thing? I mean, I think people, uh, a lot, like, when I was growing up, I didn't know why, but people, a lot of people, a lot of times were excited to meet me. Hmm. And I was just like, I, like, I haven't done anything, you know, like, I didn't, I'm just this guy, like, you know, like, people would be excited, and they had known about my dad, like, I didn't even know about Pumping Iron until I was, like, 11, 12, like, I never saw it, and mm-hmm. people would talk about it, and they, which is an awesome movie, by the way, yeah. it's you great. haven't seen oh, it's it, great. dude, yeah. it's awesome, and <laughs> yeah. even if, I don't think I'm watching it as my, like, dad's son, but I'm like, this is a dope-ass, well-done documentary, yeah, Um. so that was interesting to see people, you know, and I always got like, like there was always chatter behind me because my friends were never anybody that was really exceptionally famous. But then their friends would meet me and then they would talk all the time about me. And then it would be funny to hear from my friends like, oh, well, Lou gets this. <laughs> I'm like, well, I didn't, I don't know. You know, I think people were, and I was also a really big kid. So I was like, nobody really ever like messed with me and whatever. But um, there was just this, it was just, it was, it was, it was always an understanding for me that people, I came with a little side package in terms of meeting people. Like it was never just me. Mm-hmm. So I always had to think that people weren't really excited to meet me. And to be honest, I don't think that people, a lot of people have the, the ability to be genuinely connected to someone and talk with someone and be real aside from everything. Living in LA, you know, there's always that whole fame thing matters to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, I don't give a shit who you are, man. Like, is if you're good at what you do and you're a cool person and you're, um, and you're just an impressive human being. That's all that matters to me. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I've seen fame. I can see. I've seen what fame does to people. Fame kills people. Like it can get to that point. Yeah. But film is our uh, fame is 100% man-made. Like you just give it. You know, to mm-hmm. like these people when it's time. I guess because there's people that are famous throughout time that just are never really seen or heard from, but they just go, do great work and they're adored, and then they slip right out the back door. You know what I mean? You don't mm-hmm. have to have it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is a good kind of. Um, it's a it's it's good to recognize something that's that's good, but it's so convoluted nowadays. Do you think Do you yeah. think as an actor you need to have followers to book a gig? Or yeah. Can you, or can you just be a good actor? I'm stealing Jake's question. Yeah, yeah, this is this Jake's is, question right okay. here. No, you, um, <laughs> yeah. Let, let me because I I I want to transition that like into looking forward a little bit. Okay. You no, know, we've talked a lot about where you come from, how you do how you do what you do, but looking forward a little bit. Um the state of the current industry you've done a bunch of tv you've done a bunch of film you have you have a, a very good understanding of of the traditional industry and and everything that comes with it um with the rise of the digital industry as it has been over the last five ten years um how has that changed what you do and then is is there i have this theory that you know people does followers equal work and this is a little bit what you were saying about the deadliest catch sort mm-hmm. of thing like people get famous for a certain reason or they get followers for a certain reason and then you know uh 
are they getting work because of that or because they have followers or are they getting work because they're truly talented or is it is it both um so yeah do you think it's something where um in the future uh, as as the as the industries continue to merge and people continue to just put things on screens Mm -hmm. um do you think that followers plays a role in for example you getting work um i think that uh, follow. I think if you're good, like I said before, if you're good at anything, it will garner attention. People will be like, seek it out. You know, like, and my numbers on IMDb have gone up uh, every time I'm on SWAT, higher, if not highest on the show. I don't mm-hmm. know why, but people something like what I'm doing. I don't know what it means. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I think you'll have followers and a mass of following in that sense. I think it's definitely a plus to have a huge following for projects that are looking for people with big followings, you know? And I think it's a quicker way to get your way to the those roles. But the truth is, it's not about booking the roles. It's about, it's about, I mean, it's booking the roles, but it's like, if you're not good at what you do, you could have a million followers and you're shit, you're shit with a million followers, right. you know? <laughs> and eventually that's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be eventually gold. that burns out. Very yeah. quickly. And people mature and people change and interests go and interests wane. And if you're still shit, you're going to be shit with more followers. You know what I'm saying? Now, I think it's I, – I've worked with a lot of actors older than me that are awesome and they have great careers. And they've been working with some of the biggest names in Hollywood. And they don't even have a social Facebook. They barely have a Facebook. But a lot of times it's more of like they know they should be doing it. Um, and I think I'm lucky enough to have been around like right when as it was happening, it wasn't everything. Um, but unfortunately, I think it's going to pr- it's going to present itself as an alternative to really, really working your ass off on a, uh, um, on your craft by saying, I'd rather if I just post and do online content and get the views and viewership up, that will uh, that will justify me not going to class. That will mm-hmm. justify me not going the extra mile and challenging myself as an artist, as a professional, as anything. Um, and I think it is possible to work without followers. I think if you're a model and you're doing things that are less particular and uh, to you, and if then I think it's absolutely essential to have followers. And because that's what it is, it's essentially models now can just control which way they go, but. After a while, people get sick of a one-trick pony. I don't care who you are. If you got a great ass and that's all you got and then you spread your ass on Instagram 500 times, sweet. But then eventually stuff's going to go awry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's going to start with the person being like, I'm more than just the ass spreading <laughs> Instagram model. I want to do opera. And then it's like, no, you're the ass spreading Instagram model. Do that or we're done. And then, you know, so stuff like that happens. Because I'm. it's really interesting, Human, the human experience that we're on they're all the same in the sense of us, we're mach- these bodies and these perfect machines that have chemicals, that have hormones, that have everything that kind of work in conjunction with one another and they react certain ways. If you get sad, there's addictions possibility, all this stuff that can happen that we all go through. You midlife crisis, they say it on purpose. Everyone goes through that. So you could have a bajillion followers and work all the time and be absolutely miserable. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, and until you get there, you don't know how bad it is. Because if they have no internal life, anything to talk about, I mean, it's it's going to hurt. And eventually people are going to use that and you'll be a pawn. Yeah, I just feel like that's that's so much in the conversation now with uh, with talent that, that I've seen. It's just people are always, oh, hey, can I put this on my you know Facebook or can I put this? And But you're right. At the end of the day, it comes back to how much you're working on your talent and your craft and your and 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 doing the work. Um, and yeah, I think that's, you know, I, we've always had a, a little bit of more of an open, I think, perspective when that as because uh, a lot of people look at us from an outside perspective and go, oh, you guys are those influencers. You guys are those YouTubers sure. over there in the digital you're playing in your little digital sandbox. <laughs> right. And then that's obviously different than like traditional union CBS TV, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that the mistake that sometimes people make is not being able to learn from whatever side of the fence you're on mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, not being able to look over and go, Oh, well, there's a serious, uh, show over there where, you know, this guy says, you know, the main thing is do the work. And somebody over here on our side might say, well, it's not important as long as you have followers. And I think, yeah, just like 
as as things continue to 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 grow together, uh, which is I think inevitable with uh, technology and just the internet in general. Um, I don't want there to I don't want there to be this feeling that people in the digital space aren't aren't learning from from people in the traditional space because sure. there's so much history and structure and wisdom there that if not taken into consideration, like you know, what are you left with? You're left with the ass spreading Instagram model, with, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's va- it's just it's just vanity at that yeah. point. You know, I mean, as as like, as actors. Uh, like life happens and you have to grow with who you are and you have to adjust for that and live a normal lifestyle. Like a lot of actors live normal lifestyles and do random things that you would be surprised. They're not all shopping on Rodeo and like (laughs) buying Gucci and Fendi and getting on TMZ. It's like, it's so unnecessary, but people think, oh, you're, you're being talked about. That's all that matters. Because at the end of the day, like, I mean, like uh, Tarantino doesn't even allow phones on set. Yeah. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, that's where I want to go. I want to go working with big directors on big projects. And right now, all of my Stargirl stuff is NDA. So, and it's a big ass show and it's going to be big. And the suit that they've been fitting me for is completely custom. Every single piece to my you body. So you've gone to 13 fittings for it's it? It's been about seven fittings. Okay. Yeah. So almost wow. about, t- and then 10, including the life cast and everything. And it's so specific, everything. And I can't put anything on probably until the show airs, which is in, in August. So you, I'm cool. So you, <laughs> you have to stay the same size right now. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm natural. So I'm all natural. Okay. I'm, um, so it's like, for me, it, it's when guys fluctuate and get really big and then all of a sudden like, and then get small and everything. That's when the drugs and all that stuff come in. Yeah. But that all messes with your head. But me, no. I mean, if anything, I'm just going to cut down because my whole thing now is this. I used mm-hmm. to think it was all about, hey, I can look good on screen and be ripped. No, no, no. People aren't buying, selling by me because I'm ripped. They're buying <laughs> me because of this jaw and the, the Pentagon face that I resented <laughs> back in the day. And I'm making it work for me. So, nice. um, but That's what life's all about, man. Yeah. And it's funny, and it's like beyond that, the, what happens even with the most important part of that is really just eating clean and just being consistent with the cardio and stuff. Like very light, easy stuff. There's not a lot of heavy lifting. It's just, it's like lifting every day, yeah. you know? Yeah. This is not a bit of literally, but <laughs> yeah. It's a bit of a tangent, but, uh, you know, Christian Bale changes like physicality for a lot of his roles. Do you think he's using, you know, steroids and stuff like that to get so much muscle mass so quickly, or is he just, you think, really disciplined and. Now, what are we talking? The biggest one was Batman. Begins, yeah, he, right? he ripped up for Batman. But, you know, there's equilibrium way back in the day. And he slimmed down from the machine. Sure. Mark Wahlberg, too. Yeah, he's done. Um, I mean, Mark Wahlberg's kind of sh- he's not that tall. But I, I there's times when I've seen Mark Wahlberg and I said he could be taking some type of anabolic. But I think the Christian Bale. See, it, it, if you still, if you really put physique side by side. Well, really, the, the the determining factor is how hard the muscle is. Like it's like hard and vascular unnaturally where mm-hmm. you're like. Like if you you can't be that ripped and that big at the same time without having some type of help because when you lose all the weight and get ripped up you lose muscle mass with it naturally mm-hmm. unless you have some hormonal assistance, hmm. um, anabolics. But I don't think Christian Bale because if you start having these like super sh- if I had super shredded low abs and I was two thirty and I was jacked I mean I'm not cold in that size that ripped like that because <laughs> because not only do the muscles in uh, your body and everything like increase but the muscles in your face increase Hmm. and you look like a different human being Hmm. like it changes how you look for that time that you're using it so if you really put down how hard his his physique was in batman against it wasn't really he was kind of puffy but when it comes down to losing weight and stuff i mean matthew mcconaughey was one thing for dallas buyers but when he did the machinist i can i don't even understand how he i mean because he almost he looked just like week the week of death type of look he looked like a, a holocaust survivor yeah and he, I think he ate just one, like a patty, a hamburger a day, or oh so, if, if not at all. But like, that is a, a big, big time risk. And really, when it comes to using drugs, it's, it's a matter of putting on muscle. Mm-hmm. As people say, I have a lifetime of muscle. I play college football. Uh, this has been a part of my life from since day one. So I have a whole lifetime of muscle built on me. So it's I, for me to get any bigger would make no sense. Because mm-hmm. then I'd be like, you know, just like, Ugh, you know, <laughs> you went to SC. Yeah. And you played you played ball there. Um, I wouldn't say play, but I uh, I walked on. I hurt, got I busted my knee up. I made the squad and I busted my knee up uh, midway through spring practice. Mm. Um, and then uh, things happened. And then I I was actually released because of my injury. I had a blown ACL and mm. MCL. Knee was destroyed. It was two thirty running four six. Um, and then 
uh, but it was a classic story. Like I went the year before and I went to practice and I went to Pete Carroll and I was like, my name's Lou Ferrigno Jr. I'm going to meet you. I'm going to be working, playing for you next season. And he was like, okay. and I just, I just knew it. I just knew it. And so um, they released me. And then the next day he personally called me in and he's like, I want you to come in. And I want you to be a part of this team. And I was like, yeah, but I can't do anything. I'm on my knees. Blown. He goes, it doesn't matter. Uh, hmm. We knew what you're capable of and we could see it. And I want you to be part of this team. And it's, and it was awesome. So I got to spend a year um, with the squad. I mean, I spent a year and a half training, like, mm-hmm. on my own. Um, I worked with some trainers just to be to really push myself and achieve that um, and get to that level. But in terms of playing, no, I, I was actually injured, and that was the end of my career. Hmm. But I, was, I wanted to go to college. I graduated from college, but I always wanted to be an actor. So that was always kind of where I was going to go. And yeah. I thought football, like, I wanted to cross that off and be like, I – I could have played with the best of the best. And the truth is I could. I had the physical ability um, at that time in terms of my capability athletically to hang with the best in the country. These guys were all on full rides. They were top one program. They lost to Texas the year before in the national championship. I mean, the yeah. top program. And we, we ended up winning six straight Rose Bowls. Um, and they kept me on as a walk-on yeah. right, because of, of what I showed in tryout. Hmm. I was there. I was at Notre Dame during that during that time. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, with the Bush push or oh yeah, okay, okay yeah. I was there. Oh yeah. man, Oof, that was a rough game. Yeah, <laughs> I you know. Guys. I'm. I'm. Yeah. And that's why Jake doesn't like SC anymore. <laughs> well, I went to Notre Dame High School. Okay. Can we still be friends? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can still be friends. Okay. It's just good to know that you weren't on the field during the Bush push. That's no, no, really no, no. what I was trying to vet out no, there. No, I would, I would not. I would not have been. We would have had to end this conversation. <laughs> Which was an illegal move at the time. It was at the time. Yeah. You can do it now. Wait, but, what is the yeah. Bush push? So, okay. So just. You probably remember it. Yeah. So for those, I remember it like it was yesterday. For those of you who don't know, uh, Notre Dame used to play, plays, plays SC every year. And it's a big college football rivalry. And this was when, uh, you know, you guys were winning all these national championships and SC was by a mile, the best team in college football. They were like Alabama is today. Hmm. Um, wait, except Alabama just lost. They did. I mean, but they're but anyway. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're one of the best. Um, and so, yeah, huge game. Uh, SC was undefeated. It was Notre Dame's chance to take them out. We had the lead. They, they drove down the field in the, with like a minute to go in the fourth quarter. And it was this whole drive. I won't get into that, but the, the, the final play of the drive, uh, got like called back and then they, they, they ran it again. And then when they ran it again, because we stopped him the first time. And then they ran it again, and Matt Leinart got behind Reggie Bush. And no, Reggie Leinart, Bush, Leinart was, was trying to reach, and he was stalled. There was nothing. That's he right. Yeah, anywhere. yeah. He wasn't going anywhere. And Bush came up behind him and pushed him, <laughs> through, pushed him into the end zone. It was basically like a rugby scrum, which yeah. was illegal at the time, and they didn't call it. Yeah. Oh. And it caused SC to win the yeah. game. Yeah. Oh. And it was, man. Yeah, it was intense. It was one of the roughest <laughs> days of my life. It was, we, it was at Notre Dame. We were cheering. We had, we thought we'd won the game. Oh, man. Everybody was going nuts. I was I was at my buddy's apartment like a half mile from the stadium, and you could hear the stadium in just from how loud it was outside at his place. It was like a rock concert. It was crazy. And then we thought we won. Everyone started going nuts, and then they blow the whistle, and they're like, no, we're going to redo it. We're going to redo oh, it. Man. Oh, wow. Wow. <sighs> Man. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Look at Jake. <laughs> yeah, there's Jake's trying to shake just a little yeah. bit. <laughs> see that look see the feeling he's having right now? That I take note of and that he's affected by. So when a story comes up, that's real. Not <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's real. Look at him, he's seething. Look at him. Sorry. It's okay. We got to the we got to the the college football playoff this year, so yeah. we'll I mean, take it. That name's good. They're coming yeah. back. You yeah. join a conference, but it's all right. No, yeah. No, right. no, never. Too much, too much money to be made outside of one. That's cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um. So football was, you know, I just want, and I'm glad I did it. Although, but you know, I blew my ACL. But I could have been like, oh, my life is my shit. Why me? Right. But I went through rehab, physical rehab, for six months, and I learned so much about. Um, recovery and so much about discipline and so much of building the hard work because I had another teammate who, who tore his ACL a week after me and three months later I had done all the work because those first two weeks this first month there was really like critical for really building the strength and to support the knee mm-hmm. and this dude would come over all the time and play video games never show up to rehab to schedule rehab and he never do it and then um, when it was time to get back on the field he was out made a couple moves and then one day he just 
did this, uh, tore it, retore it. Mm. Uh, that's it. Right back into it. Yeah. And I'm like, damn. That's if you re tear it too, that's it's bad. It's a yeah. devastating injury. Yeah. You know, it's a little rubber band and that controls everything uh, lateral. It sucks. Um, right. So stuff like that. So I I've tried to take it as, you know, you got to make chicken salad out of chicken shit or so they say. <laughs> uh, you know, you I haven't can, heard that. I haven't heard it like that before. Yeah. So do you still feel that to this day? Like in what your your ACL? Well, what's, I did my left one in high school and then my right one in college. So now it's like they're even. Uh, but no, I mean, I had great doctors on both. And I, you know, I'm very, I'm very, I don't want to say I'm on, like, I'm, like when we were doing the one wheel, mm-hmm. I know what it's like to really be in pain and to really have a devastating setback mm-hmm. uh, twice. So that's not happening again. And I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that. So if it if it's at the cost of me not playing, not hooping with the boys or not hopping on the one wheel and trying a trick, mm-hmm. I'm okay with that. At this point in my life, the risk reward, I'm completely fine. And it's I'm not having to do that. Yeah. You learn, though. It's wisdom. Mm-hmm. But in terms of physical performance capability, if I hadn't had them done, I'd be probably crippled. I, like I would – every I'd give out. Like you, there's times when you, you would step and then it would just give out that now mm-hmm. when I step, it's secure. I'm like – Wow, I remember when it wasn't like that. Yeah, hmm. but you have to get the surgery, you have to do the rehab, and you have to get back on your feet to to have it work. But when it gets cold, it's a little stiff. Um, but no, man, I mean, like I'm I'm going through life pretty good. I, I feel like I'm I'm aging with some dignity. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I'm <laughs> I'm treating myself in a healthy way. I'm I'm trying to be. Um, kind of roll with the punches as life comes. Everyone complains about how they look and on this stuff. It's like. Just have a great perspective and attitude and posture really are the two kind of indicators of like that will be will help you out in terms hmm. of f- feeling young, looking young, you know? Yeah, it's good stuff. So, yeah. And no one takes as three white guys at the table <laughs> as a 23 year old white guy. Nobody takes you seriously. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I didn't. Get, I wasn't taken seriously for a long time. And then, like, you know, just you just trouble like no one wants to, you know now if i dress like this people like i walk out and i'm like a mature guy and people are like oh my god okay hi how are you people <laughs> just respond nicely to me now you know yeah it wasn't like and i was ready to fight at any moment like oh like just like injustice everywhere like you know what i mean mm-hmm. and then now it's just like it just goes with life but um i mean i definitely agree with that like taking all our like general meetings and pitch meetings and stuff we had back when, when i was 20 20 to 30 here like nothing would ever come of it. Like yeah. no one's gonna give you a budget to shoot a film when you're a 25 year old kid. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> you know, totally. So you're praying for like every gray hair in your beard. You know right. what I mean? And people be like, oh well, I mean, this guy's been around the block. Right. That's how it goes, dude. You know, from as a 24 or five year old actor, like it was, it was almost like let's see how how this turns out. Not really, we can handle. We can give this guy, you know, like a, a film. Like mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? So. Um, but you got to stick through those tough times and that's what makes the perseverance is what makes builds character. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Well, Lou, thank you so much for joining us. This has this been podcast. so great. Yeah, it was really know? cool. I loved all the perspective you had on things. There's some can't build a chicken salad with chicken shit or you whatever. Gotta, that's right. You got to make a chicken salad from chicken shit. Yeah. I like that. I like that saying. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. You're a very inspiring guy. And I think that your, um, your work ethic and your discipline comes through. And I think that that shows Mm -hmm. not only you you as a talent and and in your career but just in life and i think a lot of people can take inspiration and take that home from this so thanks for sharing that with us thank you i really appreciate that yeah Yeah. cool is there anything you want uh you want people listening to this podcast to check out of yours any swat Uh, yeah oh yeah let me hold on (laughs) (laughs) all right so we got swat Thursday, 10 p.m. I'll be on this week um, and the next few weeks. A lot of good stuff coming up. Uh, 911's coming up in March. Re- it's revamping. I'll be on the episode 212. Chimney begins. It's awesome. It's mm-hmm. been well received. And then look out for Star Girl coming out um, in around August. And at LouFrigno.com, at LouFrigno Jr. on all platforms. Where okay. can they find uh, Star Girl when that comes Star out? Star Girl will be on the WBDC streaming platform, but in October will go to Netflix. Cool. So cool. it'll be out. Star Girl, it's going to be awesome. Sweet. Thanks, Lou. Yes, thank awesome you so time. much. Great Appreciate conversation. It. All right. Well, that was a great podcast. Go check out Lou's Instagram and his art. It's good stuff. Tell him he was a cool guest. Ask him cool questions at Lou Ferrigno Jr. And guys, you may have heard this at the beginning. I'm going to remind you one more time. This podcast is brought to you by our new merch. That's right. I got a cozy sweatshirt on. You can see it if you're watching this on YouTube. It's great. It's got this cool iridescent corridor logo on the front. 
and it's really warm because it's really cold out right now. And, and I, uh, I'm not supposed to be wearing this right now beyond just showing it off, but I'm, I've been wearing it all day because I'm cold. So I stole the sample, the one sample we have to wear. <laughs> and it's great. I'm loving every second of it. So they are this, uh, not only is this sweatshirt in store, but we brought back some old designs that people loved. Uh, they are going to go fast because we have a limited stock. So if you want them, head on over to CorridorDigital.store. That's right, it's CorridorDigital.store. All right, guys, I'll see you all later. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't. You can find us anywhere else that you listen to podcasts if you want to check us out on Spotify or iTunes or what have you. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Catch you on the next one.